like to thank you for the opportunity of speaking with you today and um, talking about regenerative agriculture from an agronomist's point of view. Regenerative agriculture means a lot of things to a lot of people, but we haven't really defined what it means in the New Zealand context or what the principles that might underpin regenerative agriculture do in a New Zealand agricultural context. So that's what I'm going to try and do today. Before I do that, I just want to acknowledge the companies and organisations that contribute to the Dryland Pastures Research Group that I lead. Certainly at the moment, we're working a lot with Beef and Lamb on the Hill Country Futures Programme, supported by Seedforce and PG Rights and the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. And they've given me the opportunity of putting this presentation together. What I want to do is talk a little bit about global food production systems, take that into a New Zealand context. So what's the New Zealand response been from a dairy and a sheep and beef perspective? Think about regenerative agriculture and its definition, and also think about it from a historical current status and what it might mean in the future, and try and unravel some of the hype from the reality and put regenerative agriculture in a global but also in a New Zealand context. So this talk really tries to see where regenerative agriculture has come from and try and interpret that from a New Zealand perspective. Regenerative agriculture is just the next iteration of an age old battle in food production. And the terms may have changed, but the same principles apply. We've heard sustainable intensification versus agroecology. So Regenerative agriculture is just a new term that's come along to deal with how do we actually feed people? How do we actually produce food? Do we use agrochemicals and fertilizer and irrigation versus sustainable agriculture and organics? Do we use a high input system or a low input system? Is it an evidence-based process or a faith-based process? And this really is a battle that's been going on for quite some time. But at the heart of it is how do we feed 10 or 11 billion people? What we've done historically is had to increase food production quite dramatically since about 1960. And I want you to keep an eye on 1960 as I go through this figure. The population of the world was about 2 billion people in about 1940 and increased to about 3 billion by 1960. And then what we did to feed those people was we basically deforested land and turn that into arable production. So cropping, whether that be wheat or rice, we essentially deforested to be able to feed the population until about 1960. And then you can see the area of arable land actually flattened off quite dramatically. And through the 1970s, we saw a large intensification of the arable land that had already been deforested. So that land started to produce more, and it produced more because we irrigated it, or more importantly, we used nitrogen fertilizer. And nitrogen fertilizer allowed us to produce more grain from the land area that had already been cleared. So by 1987, when we had 5 billion people on the planet, we can see an increase in the um, rice yields from around 2 tonnes to about 5 tonnes per hectare. And similar trends, if you wanted to look at wheat, or you wanted to look at barley, or you wanted to look at maize, you'll see these increases that occurred since the introduction of nitrogen fertilizer and the advent of irrigation in the 1960s. And you'll also see that the arable land area plateauing, and then maybe just ticking up towards the end here, towards the last point when we have around 8 billion people on the planet in 2021, as we've started to see a little more deforestation occurring as our intensification or our nitrogen fertilizer use has dropped off. And you see those last couple of points there, the nitrogen fertilizer use hasn't increased, but the land area has. And that in itself is a consequence of the fact that we've started to use less nitrogen fertilizer, but the population growth has continued to occur. So that becomes an issue that we have to either intensify the land area that we're using, or we're going to cause more deforestation. A lot of people talk about that we can feed everyone that's on the planet today, and that's true. We can, and we probably will in the future, but the way we feed them is either going to be an increase in the land area that we have, or an increase in intensification of the areas that we're already producing food off. On top of that, this is a thought bubble from some work that was done by Our Land and Water, the National Science Challenge. And they interviewed a number of agricultural participants. And in the main, those participants came out and said, on top of these issues, 
climate change is going to be the big one that affects New Zealand agriculture, particularly around greenhouse gas emissions. But also consumer preferences is a big thing. So New Zealand being a major exporter of product, we have to be cognizant or aware of what our overseas consumers are of wanting to purchase and how they perceive New Zealand agricultural systems. What I wanted to do is try and put all of this into a New Zealand context and look at how we've developed our agricultural systems based on the drivers of production. And this was the very simplest experiment that I ever did. I came back from spending some time on a sabbatical in Europe in the 1990s where we were looking at climate change and the impact for European agriculture. And I came back to New Zealand and thought, well, if climate change is going to happen, who's going to be most affected? It'll be New Zealand's East Coast sheep and beef farmers. But at that time, a large amount of land on the Canterbury Plains where, where I lived was being converted into um, dairy farming and irrigation had become available. So this experiment was looking at the impact of taking an area predominantly summer dry. So it had three months of very dry when moisture deficits occurred and growth essentially ceases through December, January and February. And then we irrigated that land. So what I looked at was what was the impact of that irrigation? What was the impact of just adding nitrogen to a pasture that received no moisture? And then what's the impact of adding irrigation and nitrogen? And we can see those results from these growth curves. And you can see the additional Canterbury Plains pasture growth rates here getting up to around about 50 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day in the middle of spring and overall producing about 6.3 tonnes of dry matter. If we just add water to that system, you'll see that we produce about 10 tonnes of dry matter. And as you would expect, if you think about it, there's no difference in the yield through July, August, September and October, because in those periods, we're not expecting a moisture deficit. And into November, in most years, the soil moisture from the winter rainfall is actually enough to keep pastures growing. It's not until we get into December, January, February, March, um, and sometimes even into April and May that we see the impact of water. But that impact is not that great if you think about converting on the Canterbury Plains, putting on a centre pivot irrigator, and you move from 6.3 to 10 tonnes of dry matter. Because actually what you're seeing is that pasture that you've now irrigated is still nitrogen deficient. And when you have a nitrogen deficiency, then you're not actually dealing with the most important limiting factor in that pastoral system. And we can see here from the urine patch response what happens when you add nitrogen to a pasture. And it would be the same if we added it to a cereal crop or any other plant. We see that it becomes darker green and therefore has a higher photosynthetic rate, but also it's taller. The first process affected by a lack of nitrogen in the system is actually leaf expansion. And so if the leaves are not as big, they don't capture as much light and therefore we lose yield potential. So nitrogen fertilizer becomes really important and that's actually what's driven that increase in grain production that I showed you in the population graph where we're looking at the impact of nitrogen coming in in the 1960s. If we do add water and nitrogen then we can lift that 6.3 tonnes from my dryland pasture up to 22 tonnes of dry matter per hectare and dairy farmers would look at that and they would say that's a huge amount of pasture being grown, we only grow you know 16, 17 tonnes. What they're referring to is the amount that they harvest but when we measure the actual amount that's grown, it's about 22 tonnes of dry matter, which sets the yield potential for the environment that we're working in, particularly here on the Canterbury Plains. And so that intensification with the increase in centre pivot irrigators has allowed the intensification to up to three and a half cows per hectare being grazed year round outside. Big herds, 780 cows per herd on the, on the plains as an average. We know there are many that are bigger than that and about 1,150 herds in all, and some public backlash because the plains have changed from a summer dry, barren looking landscape to one that has centre pivot irrigators and also the impact of that dairying on the waterways. So some real issues for the dairy industry to be coping with. You can see from this graph that New Zealand started to increase its nitrogen fertiliser use only from about 1990. So in the 1960s, when urea became available, New Zealand really wasn't a user of nitrogen fertiliser. We had, particularly on the plains, mixed cropping systems where we would uh, rotate our crops. We'd have a couple of years of, for example, a white clover seed crop, 
we might follow that with a wheat crop and then that could be a barley crop and then we might go into pastures for two or three years but we had this mixed cropping system that really wasn't using as much nitrogen fertilizer the nitrogen came from the white clover seed crops or red clover seed crops that were put in for a couple of years and so the increase in nitrogen fertilizer coincided with the development of center pivot irrigation to enable the conversion to dairy farming. One of the issues associated with that application of nitrogen fertilizer is the loss of nitrous oxide, one of the greenhouse gases. And so recently there's been limits put on the amount of nitrogen fertilizer that people can use as the government tries to grapple with the issue of uh, New Zealand's contribution to climate change being predominantly from agriculture. So trying to reduce the total input of our agricultural sector on climate change, one of the tools of doing that is reduce the amount of nitrogen fertilizer that farmers can use. Now that will inevitably lead to a reduction in stocking rate on the Canterbury Plains, which then also has a feedback into the amount of methane produced. But what intrigued me most was looking at the pastures that we just put nitrogen onto. So the ones that we didn't actually irrigate. And this is where my research work has focused. And you can see here that in every month, having more nitrogen in the system has actually allowed us to increase pasture production from 6.3 to 16 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. What's happening here is we're actually dealing with what's limiting production on the plain. So most people, if I ask them, would suggest to you that in the summer prior to irrigation, the most limiting factor on the Canterbury Plains was moisture, but actually it was nitrogen. And you can see that even in June and July, by having more nitrogen in the system, we've actually increased pasture growth rates from virtually nothing to about 30 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day. And in the peak in spring, we're moving from that sort of 55 kilos up to 90 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day. And so this represents the yield gap between what was being produced and what potentially could be produced on the Canterbury Plains. And in essence, it's because all plants are nitrogen deficient all the time, except legumes. And what that means is that nitrogen is actually the most limiting nutrient, regardless of what you're trying to grow, unless it's a legume. And so legume yields are affected by the fact that they fix nitrogen. So the plant has to use about 20% of the carbon that it photosynthesizes in a day to actually do that nitrogen fixation process. So our legume crops are never going to yield as much as our cereal crops, but they fix their own nitrogen through the rhizobia symbiosis that's occurring in the nodules. And most of us are very familiar with that process. But this ability to um, increase the production of plants by getting nitrogen into dryland systems is what generated the research that we've been involved with uh, in a New Zealand context. And so what we've been doing within the Hill Country Futures work is actually comparing unimproved versus improved pasture production. So the resident here on the left and then the lucerne on the right as the improved component of that pastoral system. And what you see from that is over the last two years that unimproved system produced about 5.4 tonnes and most of that in spring and then it runs out of water. This is a dry land system on the Banks Peninsula versus three tonnes in the following year. But the lucerne producing over three times that amount of feed, essentially because the lucerne is never nitrogen deficient. So because of nitrogen fixation, it can utilize the spring moisture, which is the only moisture that's really available. It can use that more efficiently and therefore grow more pasture. And you can see, we must have had some summer rain in the first year, so we're producing up to 14 tonnes through to February. But in the dryland pasture, we're only producing around 5.4 tonnes. So a big difference in the amount of feed, but also the timing of feed. In our sheep and beef systems, the main feed demand is coming in the spring with an increase in lambing. And so you've got lactating ewes with lambs, a lot of mouths to feed, and you can see the lucerne actually providing feed in that early spring period more than the resident pasture. So it's producing feed at a time when the on-farm demand for feed is actually increasing quite dramatically. And so we've developed farming systems that are utilizing lucerne directly in this direct feed situation. So here we've got sheep on the left-hand side of the electric fence, and the cattle are also grazing here as well and getting high quality feed as a direct intake. And what happens by growing animals quickly is we actually reduce their methane output. So there's a lot of people doing a lot of work trying to reduce methane production from the agricultural sector in New Zealand 
And to date, most of those have not really been successful or led to an on-farm application. But it's really easy to see that if we have, for example, a lamb that's um, 25 kilos at weaning and we want to shift it to 35 kilos, and it's growing 100 grams per head per day, it's going to take 100 days on the farm, consume 1,300 megajoules of energy, and produce 303 grams of methane per kilogram. But if we can grow that animal faster, let's say we're growing it at 200 grams per head per day, then it's, it's on the farm, obviously, for half that time, and it's consuming a whole lot less in total energy, and less of that is going to its maintenance requirement. So we've actually got a reduction here of about a third in its methane production. So one of the ways we can actually reduce the carbon footprint of agricultural systems is by being more productive. So growing these animals quicker and cutting their heads off actually reduces the methane production. And I know that sounds rather crass, but that's actually, in essence, the business that New Zealand pastoral farming is in, is growing animals as rapidly as possible and getting them off the farm. And it's particularly important in the dryland systems that I've been working with because we run out of water after about three or four months. So if we still have animals on the farm and don't have feed, then obviously we're bringing in feed or they're growing more slowly. So their methane production per kilogram of live weight gain is going to be a, a lot more. So intensifying the spring production has been the main aspect that we've used to reduce methane production. And so we look at trying to be sympathetic with the environment, having a deep rooted plant like the lucerne here in the areas where there are some deep soils and trying to maintain soil cover or ground cover here in areas where you've got shallow soils. So on the steeper faces that are highly erodible. The reason that there's more soil in the valley is because it's fallen off the hills. Erosion is a natural process. We can't stop it, but we can reduce the rate at which it occurs. But over thousands of years, we will find that gravity will bring silt to the, the valleys. And so we can take advantage of that with deep rooted plants like lucerne. And on the dry faces, we might plant something like salt bush here in the foreground. And that intensification of areas has allowed, in this example, Bon Avery Farm, to plant off those shallow faces with not much topsoil and actually retire them into trees. So one of the things that happened in the New Zealand sheep and beef sector has been this move to planting areas that are not very productive from a pastoral sense into woody vegetation. And depending on who you ask, that offset is either 63 or 118 percent of the total emissions coming out of the sheep and beef sector. So over the time in the New Zealand sheep industry, CO2 emissions from the livestock has been offset from retiring land into either native or exotic plantings. And so what we've seen is a reduction in New Zealand's sheep numbers from around 60 million in the 1990s to just over 30 million now and therefore a, a drop in the number of lambs marked. And every year when these figures come up, the media jump on it and tell us that we have reduced livestock from the sheep and beef sector. But what they don't tend to recognise is the increase in productivity that's occurred from some of that intensification. Increased genetics, but also feeding those animals. So our lambing percentage um, increasing from around 100% on average to 130%. And at the same time, the carcass weight of those animals increasing from around 14 and a half to 18 kilos per animal. And what that does is reduce the methane production. So from an emissions intensity perspective, the New Zealand sheep and beef sector has reduced its methane production from about a kilo of methane per kilo of carcass weight down to about 0.7 or, or 0.75 kilos of methane per kilo of carcass weight. And I'm very grateful to Stuart Ledgard from AgriSearch for having done this work and shown the huge productivity changes that have occurred in the sheep and beef sector, where they are the only sector in New Zealand that has actually reduced its greenhouse gas emissions or its environmental footprint to, to this extent. So how does that work with a narrative of regenerative agriculture? Well, one of the key ingredients to regenerative agriculture is that the global food system is broken. And it's easy to suggest that we've got a lot of people that are hungry, we've got a lot of people in poverty, we've got a whole lot of other people that are obese and consuming too many calories. And the contention is that we have an over-reliance on fertilizer and pesticides, and somehow that if we reduce our fertilizer and pesticide use, we'll actually solve all of these problems. 
and that in that intensification of agriculture, we also have environmental degradation. And many of these things are true. The other aspect is that our animal welfare systems are coming under pressure, and this comes back to the, the ideas of battery hen production and could be monogastrics in terms of pigs. So the livestock inside, which is a, a common feature of protein or meat production in house systems, particularly in North America and Europe, but less so in New Zealand, where our animals actually feed outside all year. So many of these things require political and economic change. These are not things that actually agriculture on its own can change. So a hunger and poverty are about distribution and they're bigger than what an agronomist can deal with. An agronomist can simply try and deal with the other issues here around ensuring our animal welfare is of the highest standard and minimising our impact on the environment. But if you want to get into regenerative agriculture, you really need a crisis narrative. And Ken Giller wrote this when he reviewed regenerative agriculture in a recent article in Outlook on Agriculture. So the narrative has to be that agriculture is in crisis, that soil health is collapsing, that we're facing the sixth mass extinction. And I don't think many agronomists would disagree with that third bullet point or that we have plateauing crop yields. We've had the Green Revolution, the ability to use nitrogen fertilizer, irrigation, and agrochemicals to protect crops and increase crop yields, as I showed you from about the 1960s. On top of that comes the other issue of climate change and how that's going to influence our food production systems. But this whole industrialized agricultural system that we've generated since the 1960s is creating this agriculture in crisis. And how do we solve these problems? And this is where the debate comes in. Is it sustainable intensification or is it that we end up with less industrialised agriculture and less agrochemical input? So regenerative agriculture actually has friends. And from the 1980s to about 2015, the terminology really was sustainable agriculture or organic agriculture or agroecology. And each of those over time has generally dropped out of fashion. Organic agriculture is very fashionable from a Western consumer perspective, but from an agronomist perspective, it leads to about, on average, a 20% yield reduction. And if you have a 20% yield reduction in a global food system, that means that you're going to require 20% more land. If we all went organic, we're going to require 20% more land to produce the same amount of food. So it's sort of an anathema to an agronomist who is trying to produce as much food as they can out of the limited land that's available. But regenerative agriculture has been increasing since about 2016, particularly in, in a public sense, mostly driven by terminology from the NGOs and multinational companies, not really from the science perspective. Public demand for research funding towards it has happened, and the New Zealand government has responded to this. The difficulty is that currently there is no clear definition of what regenerative agriculture actually is. And in the New Zealand context, we've had beef and lamb and, and the New Zealand wine growers actually go out and try and survey overseas consumers and try and get them to determine what regenerative agriculture is. And in the main, decide that a lot of what New Zealand does would actually fit in that space of regenerative agriculture. But there are less than about 50 science publications on regenerative agriculture. And I'm grateful to the, the people that have, have done that review for us and shown us that really Regenerative agriculture as a term only came into the science community in about 2016. Those publications have been widely cited, though, about 250 citations. But for anyone that understands scientific literature, you'll understand this is still in its infancy in terms of being cited. But from a public perspective, the number of times that regenerative agriculture has turned up in the media or regenerative farming is huge. So we're, we're talking now in terms of the thousands, so an order of magnitude more. So it's really caught on with the public imagination, this term regenerative agriculture or regenerative farming. The philosophy actually dates back to about the 1980s. And when you start talking with regenerative farmers, it's difficult to pin down exactly what they're referring to. But in general, if we go back to the, the genesis of organic production, it was from the Rodale Institute, and there were a number of factors that they were dealing with. So producing high yields free of biocides was an aim, with increased soil productivity, both an increase in soil depth, but also soil fertility. A soil genesis where we get an upward flow of nutrients, stable biological 
interaction so that we create a system. The idea was that you create a system whereby what you're removing from the system is minimal. Therefore, you're creating a, like a climax forest where what goes into the system is what comes out. And it's a, a stable system that eliminates the need for using biocides or insecticides and fungicides as we might more commonly know them. And therefore, you also don't need synthetic fertilizers, supposedly, because have these stable biological interactions, particularly in the soil, which are then re releasing the nutrients from the plants that have been grown. And that there's then an intimate relationship between the farmer and the farm. And I would suggest that this isn't unique to regenerative philosophy, that actually a lot of farmers have an intimate relationship with their farm. That the system is self-reliant for nitrogen and nitrogen fixation, which is one of the tenets of this that I agree with, that we can certainly utilise nitrogen fixation. It may not be complete for all farm systems, but from a New Zealand pastoral sector perspective, then the use of nitrogen fixation has been central to a lot of what we've done. That animals are hormone free with no prophylactic antibiotics. In general, high legume content pastures may cause some animal health issues around bloat. So sometimes we do see our farmers using rumensum or uh, what's been called an antibiotic to try and reduce the impact of bloat. Increased levels of employment, we certainly get that when we have less intensive agriculture and anyone that's worked on an organic farm will know there's a lot of weeding to be done and therefore you require a lot of labour. And that there's national planning of these systems but uh, self-reliance and, and closed loop. So the original philosophy was thinking about food being produced locally and being utilised within the local community. So that there wasn't a lot of transport of goods either to or from the farm. And the idea was that this was beyond organic and increased productivity or regenerated the agricultural systems. Now, if we think where this has come from, the ideas are not new, but some of the philosophy is. And we're all aware of the Dust Bowl situation that occurred in the 1930s and 40s, so a period of, of intense dry and monocultural cropping without a lot of cover in the US resulting in these sorts of historical images. US farming has moved a lot since then. Remember, of course, this is a pre-nitrogen fertilizer period, so farming here was very basic, trying to feed a population that was growing but without the, the tools that we have available at the moment. If we think about the core themes of regenerative agriculture, then we can break them down like this. And again, this is me presenting other people's work, and I'm grateful for that having been done. But if we look at the blue, then improving economic prosperity is really essentially producing profit. And improving health is an outcome that we would expect from people being able to get access and, and able to eat food. But these are not really the main core of a regenerative system. The main core sits in these green boxes around improving the planet, but more importantly, in these brown boxes, which relate to soil health and enhancing soil health. And you can see from a, an on-farm, farm-level perspective, the majority of the activities related to regenerative agriculture can be summarised into dealing with the soil. And the references to these are around mixed farming, minimising tillage, crop rotations, manure and compost, use of perennials, minimising external inputs, and the, the other soil activities that are occurring. So when you talk to regenerative farmers, it's, it's often the soil health that they're referring to. And so that's what the focus of the rest of this talk is going to be from my perspective. There are a number of those issues that regenerative agriculture and conventional agriculture would agree and suggest our best practice. And for me, crop rotations is, is clearly one of those. Uh, the mixed cropping that I mentioned on the Canterbury Plains is a classic example of that. The use of cover crops, and certainly the US uses more cover crops than it ever did, but cover crops are also becoming important in trying to remove nitrate leaching issues that we have on the Canterbury Plains. Livestock grazing, well, this is the essence of New Zealand farming. Remember, 85% of New Zealand land cannot be ploughed, so it's hill country, and therefore livestock grazing and rotational grazing are an integral part of that land management. Minimum tillage, and then we get into a dilemma for regenerative agriculture. There's a group that will say the use of herbicides is absolutely no. And there are another group that will say, actually, if you want to do minimum tillage, then glyphosate is a tool that will allow you to do that. And that, that is true. Glyphosate 
operates on a, a biochemical pathway that isn't present in, in mammals, but is in plants, and so it's a very effective herbicide, and it's a, a major tool in the idea of minimum tillage, which is one way of reducing our, our carbon footprint. Controlled traffic, most ag agronomists would suggest controlled traffic is a good idea. The fact that we require soil organic matter for nutrient cycling, I think most agronomists would agree with that, that having some soil organic matter in the system actually enhances the process of allowing some nutrient cycling to occur and minimising soil erosion, a particular emphasis in New Zealand because we know that phosphate comes with soil erosion and we're trying to minimise the impact of phosphorus getting into waterways and potentially contributing to eutrophication. So in reality, these are practices that I think everybody, regenerative or conventional agriculturalists, should be encouraging and promoting. And they are part of the general conversations that I certainly have with the students and people that I'm interacting with. But then there are other issues around regenerative agriculture that are more difficult. That This is the crisis that needs addressing. And soil health is a term that you, you get from a conversation with many uh, soil scientists, regenerative and conventional, but there is no real term that defines what soil health is. It often links to soil biology, but there's no link to that soil biology and the function of that soil in producing crops. So we know there's a huge amount of soil biology in every teaspoon of soil that's there. There's a lot of bacteria, there's a lot of fungi, there's a lot of soil biology occurring, but we don't really understand a lot of that and the interactions that's occurring within that. But we know it's incredibly diverse, but that the link of that soil biology with the function of the soil to provide nutrients is rather limited. There's also no mention that if you increase soil biology and soil activity, you actually are going to increase nitrate leaching because one of the things that's happening with soil biology and soil activity is a breakdown of products, a breakdown of organic matter into its constituent parts and that is the release of carbon dioxide from respiration but also the release of nitrogen from the breakdown of amino acids and therefore the ability to increase nitrate leaching. So these things tend to be forgotten when people are talking about soil health and the trade-offs are seldom discussed. In general, the accepted wisdom is that if you take forest and convert it to arable, then you have a reduction in soil organic matter and soil carbon. And I'll, I'll discuss the difference between soil organic matter and soil carbon from an agronomist perspective um, shortly. But in the New Zealand context, we've actually moved from forest to pasture. And much of the evidence suggests that that move from forest to pasture has actually increased soil organic matter and soil carbon content because there are more roots and more biological activity than there was under the native, native forests that were there. Soil organic matter, however, is not soil carbon. And it's very important that people um, understand that because the, the terms are often used interchangeably. And I'm not a soil scientist, but I'm going to try and give an agronomist perspective of the difference between soil organic matter and soil carbon. So I want you to think about when you see plant residues, you see some crop stubble or you see some, some root biomass in the soil, and those plant residues are going to be broken down. And I've represented those here as being green. So you've got a part of that that's easily degradable and it's going to break down very quickly. So I call that litter. So we've got the leaves and the, the roots and the, the residual from the, the crop harvest, so the stem sitting there. That fraction will break down really quickly and often we see farmers either burn it or turn it over and expect that the soil organic matter will break down or that the soil biological activity will be such that the bacteria in the soil will break it down. And so that decomposition from the microbial biomass actually occurs rapidly. And we convert some of that easily degradable carbon tied up in the litter into carbon dioxide relatively quickly. And then the intermediate fraction and the resistant fraction remain in the soil. Over time, the microbial biomass doesn't actually change very much, but it works on more and more of the plant residues and it converts them from the green, which is the plant residue, into the blue, which is CO2. So the process of respiration from the soil microbial biomass is actually the same. It's breaking down the sugars that are in those plant parts and it's taking weeks, months, days to break that down and convert those plant residues back into atmospheric CO2. So this process is ongoing and there's only a, you know, a small resistant fraction 
that takes longer and longer. Our microbial biomass here is not really changing, but it's taking longer and it's eventually converting some of the plant residues into carbon dioxide. Now, when you can no longer identify what the constituent plants are and you've got this sort of gooey, chemically stabilized or physically stabilized mass, what you've got there is soil humus. And it's a natural process, takes a bit longer to occur, but it's more resistant to the breakdown of the bacterial mass. And so that's a byproduct of that microbial activity that we get more humus into the soil. But eventually that also decomposes and all of that soil humus actually ends up back in the atmosphere. So what we're really dealing with here is the time frame by which we get our plant residues back into the atmosphere. But over time, it will all end up back in the atmosphere. The only carbon from that organic matter, the only carbon that actually remains in the soil is the carbon particles that are stuck to the soil particles. And that is soil carbon. So that is when the mineral fraction of the soil actually has soil carbon particles adhered to it. And under pastures, that process happens and all of the sites that can be occupied by soil carbon become occupied over decades, really. And so that's what happens and we get a buildup of soil carbon. Now, if we then go and plow that paddock and we get into an arable cropping system where we might do that every year, then we actually see a breakdown of that soil carbon or that carbon that's stuck very tightly to the mineral particles of the soil. And that's really where the idea of being able to capture carbon has come from. And so if you've been cropping in the Midwest of the US for almost a century, you have broken down or removed a lot of that soil carbon, as well as the easily degradable and plant residue component of the plant material that's been put into the soil system. But eventually all of it ends up back in the atmosphere. So at best, storing soil carbon is a short term gain. From a New Zealand perspective, most of the data suggests that we've actually got saturation of our soil carbon because of the long history of pastoral farming. So increasing soil carbon takes a lot, to, you know, it takes decades to measure it. And the results over time would suggest that New Zealand has already done that. What you do get in that breakdown or, or in that returning of residues is we do get this thatch occurring on a lot of our pastures. Now, this is not soil carbon. This is organic matter. In this case, it's actually still just plant residues that will be broken down. But at this stage, it's got a carbon to nitrogen ratio of about 40 to 1. So a lot of our extensive or grazed pastures have this thatch on the top of them, which are essentially the residue of the rhizomes and stolons and, and plant roots that are decayed over time. And they actually tie up nitrogen and the biological activity stops here. So one of the first things we have to do if we're trying to get nutrient cycling in these systems is actually break down this thatch. And farmers that are breaking in new land or land that's been in a pasture for a long time will know that the breakdown of this carbon takes a, a little bit of time. And often they will apply some nitrogen fertilizer to do that. Or you might put in a rye corn or a barley crop um, and graze that crop over a year or two and then have the, the urine returns go back in and allow that nitrogen cycling to occur. We really need this ratio of carbon to nitrogen to be about 20 to 1 for the breakdown of that organic matter and the release of nutrients. So New Zealand soils actually have a lot of organic matter and the ability to have a lot of nutrient cycling because they are predominantly pastoral based. So as I've said, carbon storage is generally saturated in many New Zealand soils. Carbon storage is also, the storage rate is low and it's temporary, particularly for cropping systems. Soil organic matter only increases yields of crops if you have a nutrient limitation. So the idea of getting more soil organic matter into a system to increase yields will only occur if you are actually putting in the nutrient that is limiting the system. Nutrients do not up well. We don't bring nutrients from a long way below ground if they're not available. Nutrients generally occur in the area where there is a lot of soil biological activity. We can get roots, for example, of trees that go a long way down into the ground, and they would then be putting some carbon into an area where there hasn't been any carbon before. And this is the idea that a lot of regenerative agricultural practitioners will talk about of having deep tap-rooted species that go and put carbon deep into the soil beyond where the grasses grow.
there is some truth to that because a, a deep rooted lucerne could have its root down six meters, whereas a grass growing in the same soil might only be having roots down to about a metre. But in neither case do we actually get any upwelling of nutrients. If we want to have a system based on nitrogen fixation, then we actually have to ensure that the other nutrients are not limiting, particularly phosphorus and sulphur. There's no free lunch. Nitrogen fixation is an energy intensive process. Breaking an, a triple bond, a nitrogen triple bond by the bacteria requires energy and that energy source is actually phosphorus. So nitrogen fixation will be compromised by a lack of phosphorus. So there is a lot of hype around some of these things because the law of the limiting kicks in. And this is Liebborg's law of the limiting, essentially saying that the yield of a crop will be based on the most limiting factor. And if you think back to the example I gave before of water versus nitrogen, in most cases, people would think water was limiting, but in fact, nitrogen was the most limiting factor in that scenario. Here we're dealing with well, which nutrient is the most limiting. It's all very well having a lot of potassium in the soil, but if you haven't got enough sulfur, then you're not going to get plant growth. So the law of the limiting suggests that all nutrients are required to be maximized, or we're going to have a limitation to the yield, particularly because we're going to have a reduction in light and deception and the efficiency with which we use the light that we've captured. We'll also have a reduction in the water use efficiency or the amount of production that we have per unit of water that is displaced. Because if the loss of water occurs from the system, regardless of whether the ground cover is growing two tonnes of dry matter or 20 tonnes of dry matter, the rate of evapotranspiration will be the same if the growing conditions are the same. This is an example to illustrate the impact of phosphorus in the system. So this is an experiment from a student who was looking at sweet corn and in between the rows was actually a weed and he went out and sprayed the weed to get rid of it. But the weed was actually subterranean clover. And so it's a legume that we were wanting nitrogen fixation to occur from. And, and this was an old pasture. And you can see the crop here looks a little bit yellow. That's the sweet corn crop coming up. Right next to it, we had increased the phosphorus content and you can see both the maize or sweet corn plants in this situation and the weed in between and that weed is subterranean clover so the phosphorus in the system has actually allowed nitrogen fixation to take place which has allowed the subterranean clover to grow but it's also allowed photosynthesis to take place which has allowed the sweet corn to grow now the key point about this is that phosphorus is bound to the soil so plants have to grow a root system that will actually interact with the soil and draw phosphorus from it. After about six weeks in this experiment, the roots of these plants were actually big enough to get enough phosphorus to grow the rest of the crop for the rest of the season. So the yield differences that occurred between this crop and this crop all occurred within that first six weeks when there wasn't a big root mass, particularly from this crop, and therefore it had inadequate phosphorus to really maximize its photosynthesis as a seedling. And this is a bit like having $100 in the bank at a 2% interest rate versus $10,000 in the bank at a 2% interest rate. What you start with is going to make a difference to what you end up with. And in this case, the, the weed being the subclover showed how important that phosphorus was to the nitrogen fixation process. So having a little bit of starter phosphorus is really important and many regenerative agricultural farmers will actually suggest a little bit of phosphorus is used at establishment to ensure you get growth. And then they take advantage of the fact that our soils may actually have quite a lot of phosphorus already. Now that will be fine provided no other nutrient becomes limiting. If we think of the regenerative agriculture idea of a crisis to address, biodiversity being the other one, there's no evidence that we have a crisis in soil biology. In fact, the soil biology within, within any um, pastoral or cropping system is generally huge and mostly uninvestigated. The idea is that you have more soil biological activity within a multi-species system than you do within uh, monocultures, but there isn't a lot of evidence to support that either. But there is the evidence to suggest that once you move from a productive system to an organic or a, a less intensive system that you will have a decrease in production. And this is one of my concerns is that if we decrease production globally, we actually are going to cause more problems in, in the biodiversity space because we're going to end up chopping down more trees. So the question becomes, are we dealing with a paddock or a landscape? Should we be looking at the biodiversity at a paddock level or at a landscape level?
There is no doubt that some of the pesticides that have been used are reducing insect populations. And so I think the regenerative agricultural community and the conventional agricultural community would agree on this point and therefore minimising the use of pesticides and looking for different chemistry it has been the modus operandi for conventional agriculture of late. One of the things to remember though is that we're already using the best land. So if we are going to reduce production on a land area to through organic or regenerative processes, then the best land for growing crops has already been utilised on the planet. So we are going to be moving on to more marginal land, which is probably going to require even more intensification and more inputs to produce yields out of it. So this is a real issue if you're looking at a global perspective rather than looking at a developed economy perspective where you might be appealing to consumers rather than thinking of feeding the world. So a monoculture is considered a bad situation in a regenerative agricultural sense, but from a, a Midwest US farmer's perspective, this is potentially a very good land use because it makes more sense to grow the grain here and shift it to the animals than it would for the animals to be out here grazing it. And other people would suggest that actually just eating the, the corn would be the most useful thing to do. But there's a lot of costs go with doing that as well. I mean, not everybody wants to eat corn as the basis of their diet. From a landscape perspective, this is what we've done with our pastoral sector here, is try and have this landscape diversity and get the biodiversity into the landscape. So we've got here a monoculture of lucerne on the deep soils, taking advantage of those soils, fixing nitrogen and being as productive as it can be, but leaving the areas of this paddock, or in this case it's a high country area, that are not very productive. And so this biodiversity is occurring within the landscape. So there's a dilemma here about landscape biodiversity versus within the paddock. Regenerative agriculture looks for within paddock multi-species production. And this has really come out of some work in Switzerland where people are looking at having you know, many, many plant species in a mix and therefore encouraging biodiversity not only of plants but also of insect population. One of the, the differences here is these plots that generated this data have never seen an animal. They're all cut and carried. And you've got to remember that in, in Europe, Europeans have essentially abdicated responsibility for their food production to South America. You can be paid in some of these places, in Germany and in Switzerland, for the diversity of species that you have in your pasture. But you would cut and carry this pasture and take it to the animals, or you may not graze it at all. And that's quite different from a New Zealand perspective. New Zealand actually started with multi-species mixes way back when we were first trying to work out which species to grow. Remember, all of the pasture species we have in New Zealand are imported. There are no natives. And this is an example of a seeding rate of around about 26 pounds per acre, which would be similar sort of equivalent of kilos per hectare now. And a multitude of species put within this um, pasture mix in the 1950s. But latterly, we've come back to um, two or three species in our mix. And predominantly in our wetter areas, that's a, a perennial ryegrass-based pasture, particularly with some, some white clover in it. And we might also be including a, a herb. So we've done quite a bit of work at Lincoln looking at the impact of having multi-species mixes on pastures. This is work that my colleague Alistair Black's been involved with. So we've looked at all possible combinations of a number of species to see how much dry matter we can produce and what happens to those pastures over time. So here's a five-year time span of sowing a monoculture of perennial ryegrass and looking at the yield that we produced, or a monoculture of plantain, and not very much difference, a slight difference in the plantain, or a monoculture of white clover, or actually red clover. And so we sowed those monocultures, and you can see there's not very much difference in their yields. When we put two species together, and it didn't really matter which the two species were, although a grass and a legume obviously gave us more production than two legumes, then you can see having two species in a mix actually increased the yield of these pastures. If we shifted to having three species in the mix, and this is the, the summary of all three species, we've got about the same as having two species in the mix. On occasion, we can see the benefit of having three species in a mix. But having four or more, we've done work with five or six species in a mix, actually gives us no yield advantage. And it gives us no advantage in terms of the quality of feed produced, and it gives us no advantage in terms of the species composition. Effectively, once you have a grass, a legume, and a herb in your pasture mix, 
then you're maximizing the production potential out of those species. And what we're doing now is looking at the legacy effect of what's left behind. So what's the soil biological activity that's left behind after these pastures? And what's the nitrogen inputs that might be left in the system? But effectively, no benefit from going more than about three species in a pasture mix. If we think about regenerative agriculture from a climate change perspective, it's another crisis we're trying to address from a New Zealand perspective. Our soil carbon levels are already high. The international literature suggests we could potentially capture between 10 and 15% of the current CO2 and store it. But remember that any storage of soil CO2 will be temporary. And so really it's not a solution to climate change, although it's being advocated as one. And we've had some outrageous claims of how much soil carbon can be captured through regenerative agricultural practices. And certainly they're not true. It's about 10 to 15 percent. Nitrous oxide reductions from less nitrogen is certainly true if we're not using nitrogen fertilizer. But remember that nitrous oxide is still going to be occurring from the use of manure. So if you're taking animal waste products and spreading those onto the ground or injecting them as occurs a lot in Europe, there is also nitrous oxide being produced from that system as well. But it's often not measured in regenerative agricultural practices. Certainly most of the data would suggest that there isn't a lot, but most of it would suggest particularly from the organic space, that we will have a lower stocking rate. And if you have lower stocking rates, then that's less methane, certainly, and that could be a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. But also from a global perspective, then that's less food. Globally, if we're producing less food, we're going to need more land. And so there's a dilemma here for Western cultures that want to embrace regenerative agriculture, is that they're going to put the production requirement onto less developed countries. Those animals are often being exposed to tall herbage and therefore are slower growing. And so more methane production, slower animals are going to produce more methane. Or if they're not slower growing and they're growing at the same rate, but at a lower stocking rate, then obviously we've got less intensive production. So we have this issue of global deforestation being required to compensate for less production. So regenerative agriculture really does depend on your perspective. Are you looking at it from a feed the world perspective or are you looking at it from a marketing perspective where you want to appeal to high value consumers? So if we look at a multi-species mix like this and we went in to graze it, then we're obviously going to be able to take some good quality feed off it, but there's a lot more fiber in a system that's being left to get to the stage of pasture development before it's grazed. When you have tall herbage, for that herbage to stand up, it requires fiber. If I build a one-story building versus a 10-story building, I need more structure in the 10-story building. And that's the same for plants. If they're going to be taller, they require more structure. And that structure is fiber, it's lignin, and that lignin is not very palatable, and therefore the animals are not gonna grow as well if they have to consume lignin than if they can consume a short, leafy pasture. So the question becomes, which of these two systems is actually the best? A regenerative agricultural system on the left or an intensive pastoral system on the right? Both of these farmers think they're doing the right thing by the landscape. Which one you see as being the most useful will depend on your perspective. One of them is sequestering carbon into some woody vegetation and some taller tussock-like vegetation but it won't be growing as many animals. The other one has got high quality feed and will grow animals more quickly and therefore reduce its methane production, but is not sequestering carbon. So there's some real dilemmas as to which is the most useful system from an agronomist perspective, the one on the right, from a regenerative agricultural perspective, potentially the one on the left. The other thing that I struggle with is I don't think that this idea of capturing carbon actually deals with the issue of climate change. When I first started working on climate change, I was dealing with ambient CO2 of around 350 parts per million. And you can see that level of CO2 has continued to rise with that sort of sawtooth pattern occurring over time. This is data from Mauna Loa in Hawaii and should be familiar to most people. That sawtooth occurring from when the Northern Hemisphere starts photosynthesizing and the sea warms up and therefore we get a drop of about three or four parts per million of CO2 concentration. But over time, we have this continued increase in CO2 levels. And that CO2 level has really come from the fact that, remember my 1960s, we've put another 5 billion people on the planet. So there is a 
very strong relationship between energy consumption per capita and the release of fossil fuels. And so if we want to stop global warming, we actually have to deal with the issue that energy consumption is going to increase as long as we continue to increase the number of people on the planet. So when you know people in all populations, whether they be a Western developed one or a developing economy, they're looking for food and energy. And it's the global question of how we provide that food and that energy that we really need to be having conversations about that we don't seem capable of doing at the moment. We think about that energy supply a very small amount of it comes from traditional biofuels. This is wood for burning, predominantly charcoal for um, Africans in their traditional systems to maintain the fire for cooking. Coal, we know, is used a lot for energy consumption as crude oil, keep an eye on 1960, as is natural gas. And you can see the huge increase in energy supply to provide energy to that increasing population since around the 1960s has predominantly come from burning fossil fuel. Personally, I would prefer there was more of it being produced from nuclear. And um, this is a dilemma that the recent COP has had to deal with. Is nuclear actually a clean energy technology or not? Because the current rate of renewables is not going to deal with the amount of energy required for a growing population. About 12% of the total energy production in the world was from renewables in 2020. And although there's a lot of hype around the renewable sector, it isn't dealing with the main issue here that fossil fuel is still the main form for energy. And that really needs to be addressed. And my concern is that if we start allowing consumers to think that regenerative agricultural practices or capturing carbon from soil is going to deal with climate change, what we're actually doing is letting people off the hook and not recognising that it is energy consumption and the need to move away from fossil fuel consumption that actually the planet requires to reduce CO2 levels to a, a level that we might be able to cope with more easily in terms of temperature change. So regenerative agriculture has some unanswered questions and I thank Ken Giller for, for summarising these so nicely for us in his paper. What is the problem that is being fixed? what is actually being regenerated and what agronomic practice will provide that regeneration? Will it work economically and socially? And what political, social vested interest forces are driving the use of any proposed solution? And this is a real question that needs to be asked in New Zealand because there's a lot of vested interests in forcing regenerative agriculture onto our agricultural sector and there's a lot of hype around the regenerative scene at the moment. For me, the reality is that a lot of the regenerative agricultural practices lack an evidence base. And so from a political perspective, the government has asked people to try and provide that evidence base for that regenerative agricultural practice. In conclusion, regenerative agriculture ignores the complexity of farm systems. It ignores the complexity of global feed systems. It ignores the diversity of agricultural systems in time and place. So. Regenerative agriculture may be a very useful principle for restoring or regenerating a soil that's been degraded from intensive cropping for a long period of time. But that doesn't deal with the diversity of agricultural systems, for example, in the New Zealand landscape. And so when you're talking about one solution, regenerative agriculture, it really needs to understand the complexity and the diversity of agricultural systems that exist already. There is not one solution fits all. Regenerative agriculture requires a soil crisis and a biodiversity crisis, and I would contend that these are not universal, particularly the soil crisis. It contends that we need to fix agriculture and we need to fix a failing food systems. And we have heard these terms for decades. It comes back to the question of what is it that we need to fix? And I'm not sure that at the farm level we require the level of fixing or we're going to provide the solution to those more major problems of hunger, obesity, economic insecurity that regenerative agriculture is hoping to, to do. China, the US and Europe certainly could reduce inputs and the Europeans have certainly done that. They've brought in bans on nitrogen fertiliser and, and New Zealand has recently done the same. That reduction in nitrogen fertiliser will actually lead to a reduction in production of New Zealand farm systems as it has in Europe. From a New Zealand perspective, that doesn't make too much difference to us because we can 
produce and import enough food to feed our population. But from a European perspective, what that has meant is that they are more reliant on the importation of food from other countries. The other issue that I have is that a regenerative agriculture distracts from CO2 driven climate change. And it, it allows people to think that we have a solution by changing our agricultural systems, when in fact, most of the world's scientists know that the issue that we need to deal with is the production of CO2 from fossil fuels for energy production. So there's a lot of hype, and that hype is politically expedient at the moment. And from a New Zealand perspective, some of our organisations are suggesting it provides us with a market opportunity because many of the systems that we have in place already are regenerative. I'll leave that there for you to conclude your own take on whether regenerative agriculture has a place in global, New Zealand or local farm systems. Thank you.